Next on the Broadway show, we'll take you back to the Tonys for Broadway's biggest night. Plus, strike first, strike hard. We're on the road with the musical adaptation of The Karate Kid. And Feed Me Seymour, we're going to talk to the star of the delicious off-Broadway revival of Little Shop of Horrors, Skylar Astin. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching The Broadway Show. The Broadway Show is back with another stellar episode. I'm Tamsin Fidel. First things first, let's talk Tonys. The 75th annual Tony Awards ceremony is in the books. Broadway's biggest stars on Broadway's biggest night. And let's talk about some of the night's biggest winners. I want to break the cycle that's so ingrained in me, but change comes way too slow and I am in a hurry. There's Heading into Tony Night, A Strange Loop was the most nominated show with 11 nods. The musical ended up taking home two prizes, Best Musical and Best Book of a Musical for writer, composer, lyricist Michael R. Jackson. Phone rings, door chimes, he in comes company. The gender flip version of Company took home five prizes, including Best Revival of a Musical, Best Featured Actor for Matt Doyle, and Best Featured Actress for Patti LuPone, her third Tony win. The Lehman Trilogy also won five Tony Awards, including Best New Play, while Take Me Out won for Best Revival of a Play. A couple more highlights, newcomer Miles Frost won the prize for Best Actor in a Musical for the mind-blowing way he channels Michael Jackson in MJ. In Paradise Squares, Joaquina Calocango won for Best Leading Actress in a Musical. Her performance of the show's anthem, Let It Burn, was an emotional high on Tony Night. Now that we've talked about Broadway's biggest night, let's talk about Off-Broadway's hottest ticket, Little Shop of Horrors, because suddenly Seymour is Skylar Aston. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Hailed by theater fans for performances in Spring Awakening and TV's Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, Skylar Aston is finally back on the New York stage in Little Shop of Horrors. We caught up outside the West Side Theater. This is Little Shop of Horrors. This is Little Shop of Horrors. One of my favorite musicals. Is this like a, a show that you have deep connections to? Have you been performing this in your bedroom since you were a little wannabe Broadway performer a little, kid? A little tyke, as they say in Little Shop. <laughs> I actually, um, hot take, no. It's now become something I'm deeply connected uh -huh. to, but uh, I only knew the hits, Somewhere That's Green and Suddenly Seymour. And uh, I came into this seeing, I have, I have seen the 2019 production in the, the original cast. So I saw John Johnson and Tammy. Johnson okay, your in, Spring Christian. Awakening friend. Yes. Yeah. So I saw that. So based on that and just the source material, I was so excited. You did not have this, what, what, like, what I didn't how know this show? I didn't know Grow For Me. I didn't know, no. I didn't see the movie. Insane. Where have you been? A big musical theater blind spot. <laughs> I'm not some like movie TV guy who doesn't know his stuff either. Like I know yeah. my stuff. Yeah. It's weird, I guess in hindsight, now that I know it so well, yeah. it's it's I could say it it was a dream role. Now I would be disappointed if I didn't get to do it in some capacity. But it must be fun. It's such a great classic Alan Menken, yeah. uh, Howard Ashman score. Well, just like with any of his stuff, you, now you can't unknow it. I'm like quoting it in this interview. Like I, you know, <laughs> I, it's 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 so embedded in me already. Now you you hear the the seedlings of Be Our Guest and Part of Your World yeah. and Newsies. Uh, and, and that classic, iconic Mencken Ashman sound. And this is one of their earlier works. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to do one that I find perfect. So let's talk about Seymour. Okay. He's kind of the ultimate nerd. Is he a nerd? Is he a geek? What is he? He's. I think he's a introvert, a, a misunderstood uh, a young man who sleeps under a counter in the basement of a flower shop. And so that that affects an him orphan, socially. A child an orphan, of the streets. A child of the streets. <laughs> and um, and I think that affects the way he sees life. He wants what he, he does he can't have, and that's freedom from um, his his given circumstances. And that's a very understood thing. That's a classic I want moment. You know, part of your world. I want to be where the people are, and 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 that's that's how we find Seymour. And then he is presented with a pretty unique opportunity. Right now, I'm sure this changes all the time, but right now, what is like your favorite moment in Little Shop every night? Get It's really funny. Not funny, fun. 
get its fun. Uh huh. With the plant. Yeah. Yes. I like the moment I lead into the song, because the audience always like gets excited. The lights go green. He says, "Feed me." Does it have to Feed be me. human? Feed me. Feed me. Does it have to be mine? Feed me. Where am I supposed to get it? And then I have a big rock star moment. Yeah, And I get do. up on the table. Yeah. What is it like being with that puppet? Love it. It feels like I'm talking to the real thing. Yeah. It's it's done so expertly by Eric Wright and Teddy Udane and uh, and Aaron, of course, voicing the plant. It's just this beautiful moment of theatrical synergy and magic. And I love playing with it. We we actually like found a beat, like a, like a fun new beat with the plant that we have to like now kind of readjust for, like physically, because it takes literally three people wow. to come up with a new bit. So there's a moment where I kind of draw him in to look at me, but now we've been doing this kind of tag. I don't know, it's just nerdy stuff like yeah. that that I love. Little Shop of Horrors started as a little off-Broadway show, right. and then it became this big movie, then it became a Broadway musical, and right. this is sort of a return to the roots. Yes. It's a nice, small, intimate, the West Side Theater is like a great, perfect. great theater for this show. Yes. I, I think this is the perfect house for this production. Yeah. I think it's integral to the piece. Uh, what I love so much about Michael Mayer's vision with this production specifically is that it has no intentions of transferring to Broadway and yeah. becoming any sort of um, run like that. And so I think that took the pressure off and, and it just gave a perfect sandbox for this to live in. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's real theater magic, right? It and it's like kids in high school doing a yeah. show almost because yeah. it's like, it's everything sort of down to the bare bones. Yeah, one, one boy's dressing room, one girl's dressing room, like close quarters and all love, all bits, all comedy, all nerdy like little trinkets we all have on our stations. These are my people. You know, there's been a lot of sort of celebrating about Spring Awakening again, uh, now that you're all accomplished adults who have gone on to so many amazing things. What's right. it been like hearing everybody sort of talk about it again and doing the re reuniting on Broadway? And it's been amazing. I, I really like talking to people that saw the documentary that weren't here in 2006 to see it. And they just, they get the sense of its importance and um, of that time specifically in my life that I've only been retelling people, you know? I was like, you don't understand, because it was pre-Twitter, in a way like pre-camera phones. I mean, there were yeah. pictures to be taken, yeah. but not, not in the same way. And we were like the Beatles of 49th Street. Like, you remember, yeah. it was, you know, <laughs> pre-COVID, so people were at the stage door grabbing and tugging, but it really speaks to the vitality and the strength of theater and the significance of being here when it happened. It's like a time capsule. And so explaining that to people is kind of difficult. And now we have this amazing representation of what it was and what it's become and where we are and where we've come and very grateful for the, those who've known the documentary. We've talked about it before, Broadway shows get their start all over the country and all over the world. And right now the gateway to the West could also be the gateway to the Great Bright Way. Fear does not exist in this dojo, does it? No, Sensei! Pain does not exist in this dojo, does it? No, Sensei! Right now, the Karate Kid the Musical is getting its pre-Broadway tryout in St. Louis, Missouri. Show me wax on, wax off. Yes! 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 Of course, The Karate Kid is an iconic movie that means a whole lot to generations of movie lovers, including the musical's cast and creative team. I'd seen it as a kid, and it was something that sort of kept coming back to me over the years because it has been woven so deeply into sort of American pop culture. And like, there are lines and iconic moments from the film that have just become part of our vernacular. I saw the movie in 1984. Uh, when it first came out. Um, I was a kid at the time, and it was something that, you know, we all would watch at a sleepover, and I, I think I had a poster of Ralph Macchio on my bedroom wall. I'm pretty sure that was there. I saw it when I was 16 years old and in the movie theater, and it was a profound experience because, I mean, about um, maybe two or three weeks before I saw this, I had seen 16 Candles, which of course has Long Duck Dong, and that was my experience of seeing myself on camera my whole life. Characters like Long Duck Dong, objects of ridicule, people who are just ridiculous. And now here's this movie, The Karate Kid, with Pat Morita and an, an iconic character, Mr. Miyagi, who has dignity 
and, and humor and dimension. Uh, and it really had a, a profound effect on me. Make a perfect picture. But how do I know if my picture is the right one? If come from inside of you, always right one. The Karate Kid was the fourth highest grossing movie of 1984. Needless to say, the musical's cast knows they have big shoes to fill. Just coming to the U.S., because I'm, I'm from Canada, I, I crossed the border. The first thing the U.S. border uh, agent said when I said why I was uh, coming here is, oh, Big shoes to fill. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know. I began uh, with this project by by not understanding the two thoughts of Karate Kid, the musical. I, it really took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around what that would be and what that would sound like. And once I was explained their vision and their concept here, I was struck and I was like, oh my, this is far beyond my expectations. And now we're in a place where I think we're gonna defy everybody else's expectations. It's also worth mentioning the creator and screenwriter of the original movie, Robert Mark Kamen, is back, writing the book for the new musical. I never thought of it this way, and I resisted it. Our producer, Kumiko Yoshi, would not give up, and she pursued me until she got to sit down and talk to me about it, and sort of hesitantly, I said, okay, I don't see it, because I'm not a musical theater person. And little by little, I got sucked into the process, and what I found was, that these characters I created 40 years ago could be given a deeper, richer, more resonant voice with music and song. The first thing to know that sets this musical apart and maybe blows it out of the expectations you already have is that it is set as a flashback for Mr. Miyagi. So he's the first voice you hear, the first person you see. And so to center the story on Mr. Miyagi provides a perspective that is uh, something that is unexpected and um, I think quite artistic. Daniel's attitude in the original movie towards, um, you know, let's just let's call it what it is. He's, he's a bit of a macho hothead and that doesn't fly as well in today's sensibility. So Ali is a character who just, who calls him out on his machismo. She's got her own agency and I think, um, her character's got a lot more depth. So I think you're hearing a lot more from the female perspective in, in our version. I never thought there'd be a Karate Kid the musical, but hey, you know, I didn't think there'd be a musical about the life of Alexander Hamilton either. So improbable things happen and they turn into great entertainment. There's still a lot more to talk about on this edition of the Broadway show. Coming up, he's the youngest star of The Music Man, we're getting to know one of Broadway's fresh new faces, 10-year-old Benjamin Pajak. This is The Broadway Show, and we're back in just a few. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of The Broadway Show. So glad you're here. You got trouble, you got trouble. Right in the city. Right in the city. With a T that rhymes with P that stands for four. The Musing Man is Broadway's biggest opening since live theater returned to New York City. And while it's Tony Award winners Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster on the marquee, the revival also marks the debut of 21 young Broadway newcomers, including Benjamin Pajak. He is this week's Fresh Face. Hi, my name is Benjamin Pajak and I play Winthrop Peru in the revival of Music Man on Broadway. I started loving theater when I first saw Phantom on Broadway. I was six years old. I was in the house. I put on the mask and the vest and the cape, and I fell in love with it. I loved the singing and the acting and the lighting cues. And ever since then, when I started watching Broadway shows, it just got better and better. I still remember when I was two years old, I fell in love with Adina Menzel's voice in Wicked. That's all I would listen to to go to sleep. It just was hypnotizing me. My mom found out about the open call. She was just casually sitting there, scrolling on her phone through Facebook, and then she sees, oh, an open, an open call? 
she says, hey, Benjamin, I found an open call. Do you want to go to New York this Saturday? And I said, sure, I'll do it. So she goes to Apple Music and finds Gary Indiana. It wasn't even in the right tune. So I learn the songs and I show up at the audition and I start singing in the, in the wrong tune. I knew Hugh Jackman when I first auditioned for it. I knew him in one movie, Wolverine. I didn't know Sutton Foster at all. I knew that she was in Anything Goes. I knew that she was an amazing, talented actor, and I knew that she had an amazing voice. So I knew that they were two of the most amazing actors. But I think over time, we, the three of us bonded with each other. At this point, I consider them more friends than stars at this point. When I found out that there were gonna be kids in it, I flipped out because I had people to actually talk to who understand things that I like and things that I do. That was an, another thing that I was very excited about. Music Man got me into playing cornet. So I think I wanna, even though when this stops, I think I wanna keep going on with that, possibly learn trumpet as well. I wanna do Love Never Dies. I wanna be the kid in Love Never Dies. And I also wanted to do Billy Elliot, even though I'm not really a dancer, but <laughs> you know how it is. The $10 founding father still holds Broadway's hottest ticket, and Hamilton features some truly spectacular physical performances. We met up with one of the show's great performers at Open Jar Studios to find out why he's just got to dance. My name is Preston Mui. I am in Hamilton, and I play George Eager in the ensemble. I first started dancing when I was 10 years old. I did my first musical, which was Oliver, and I became obsessed with the stage. At 10 years old, I decided to start training for my Broadway debut. <laughs> I took a dance class out of a home garage from my first dance teacher <laughs> at Star Dance Studio I am in San Francisco, California, where I just studied tap and jazz, and then eventually went to an arts high school. There I studied modern, contemporary, African ballet, and then um, I moved to LA, training in hip hop and jazz funk, and really learning the Hollywood ropes. When I first found out I was joining the Broadway company of Hamilton, I was choreographing a show in Las Vegas, and I actually wasn't expecting to come back to my journey as a performer. After 20 years of my career in Los Angeles, the thought of coming back to the stage and finally fulfilling my Broadway dream this late in my journey was so mind-blowing to me. The night of my Broadway debut, I remember messing up so much. Learning Hamilton is a huge undertaking. It's three hours long. You're learning it by yourself in a dance studio. And there's so much information you have to retain. And so the night of my debut, it was like I had to let all of that go and just perform whatever was going to happen with my body and my voice. <laughs> and so, yes, mistakes were made, but it was so fun and everyone on stage is so supportive. They just helped move me along. It was just such an amazing experience. Dancing for audiences right now in Hamilton, especially after this pandemic, it has been cathartic for myself, but Knowing that I can bring a little bit of joy to people for a few hours in a night, it's, it's better than what it does for me. It's more that I get to do something for other people while also doing something I love. If my younger self knew that I was where I am now, that little chubby Asian kid with a bowl cut would be freaking so excited. <laughs> my younger self would just be really happy to know that all the hard work was worth it. What I'm most proud of isn't one job in particular or one person that I've ever worked for. It's mostly that I was able to forge a way into this industry and to maintain a career and to create a livelihood for myself 
in an industry that doesn't have a lot of representation for people like me. So I feel most proud that I was able to stand on my own two legs and really just work and create a lane for myself and for others coming after me. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.